Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along to the meeting today. And can I welcome members of the Scottish Affairs Committee. Thank you all very much for coming here today. Um, this is technically a, a meeting of the Social Security Committee, uh, but in practice, it's a very much a historic joint meeting and uh, the very first meeting of the two committees together. So whilst for what we would call technical reasons, MPs are listed in the agenda as witnesses, uh, I'll treat you all equally as members of the committee and would like to hope that it flows very smoothly, the questions here today between MPs and MSPs also. And we are here today because uh, the two committees have agreed to examine the relationship uh, between the Scottish Government and the DWP and whether it is good enough to deliver the devolution of Social Security as set out in the 2016 Scotland Act. We'll do that with uh, two panels today, first from a number of individuals who I know are in a position uh, to examine the relationship at first hand, and the second from senior officials of both the Scottish Government and the DWP who are charged with delivering the devolution of Social Security. And then we'll follow us up with the meeting at Westminster next week when both the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and the Cabinet Secretary for Committees, Social Security and Equalities have agreed to appear before us. Uh, and after that, evidence will move into private and agree a letter which will be sent out with our thoughts. I'll convene the meeting today in the Scottish Parliament and my colleague Pete Wishart will convene the meeting at Westminster before I open up and introduce yourselves, I'd just like to say we have apologies from Pauline McNeil. And also could I ask everyone to turn off their mobile phones as it does interfere with the sound system as well. So i just introduce yourself, please, the panel of witnesses. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to come today. I'm Nicola McEwen, Professor of Territorial Politics at the University of Edinburgh. I'm uh, John Dickey, Director of the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. And uh, Bill Scott, I'm Director of Policy for Inclusion Scotland. Thank you very much. I think you're all pretty well known, not just to us, but obviously the Westminster MPs as well. Could I kick off with the first question? And can I ask each of you from your perspective, how would you characterise the relationship between the Scottish Government and the DWP? So, you've opened yourselves. Um, it's, I suppose it's difficult to tell because a lot of the negotiations and discussions um, take place behind closed doors and we occasionally see minutes, um, but they're often carefully crafted minutes. Um, I think the relationship between officials um, has been probably surprisingly good as far as we can tell. And I think that there was a lot of investment put into that relationship. Um, particularly by Stephen Kerr, who I believe that you will be speaking to, and Richard Cornish, um, when he was in, in the post before, and that was built up within the Smith Commission and carried on, and I think that's, that's probably made an enormous contribution. Um, but there will inevitably be difficulties, uh, given the different political mandates that the governments are working to, and the complexities of implementing and managing uh, the social security uh, systems going forward. And I think that one thing that does worry me is that um, a lot of the focus, inevitably perhaps, um, is on implementation of the new powers, but there will need to be attention given to the ongoing oversight of the, the interdependencies between what's devolved and what's reserved um, on an ongoing basis beyond the implementation stage. And it's, I'm not at all clear how that will work yet. Thank you very much. John Dickey. Yes, I mean, I think I echo that. I mean, we certainly sense from our engagement both with Scottish Government officials and with DWP officials that there's commitment there across the board to work cooperatively together to make this work and to ensure the transfer of powers uh, works smoothly and is delivered smoothly. Um, however, I sort of echo Nicola, and it's, it's a bit difficult to say we're not privy to much of how that cooperation uh, is working in practice. We see some of the outcomes in terms of minutes, or more recently, particularly, say, draft regulations emerging around um, how the, the new universal credit flexibilities might be used in Scotland. Um, but we don't actually see the working process um, for how social security policy originating in one government uh, is being, um, you know, is interacting or overlapping uh, with, with, with policy from the other government. I think it's also worth 
fair to say that there's, there have been some early warning signs that suggest that the current processes and agreements and arrangements um, could be strengthened um, to ensure that the needs of claimants come first in this whole process. And I suppose that's where we're coming from uh, as Child Poverty Action Group, is that the context of this is that Social Security plays an absolutely vital role in protecting uh, children and families from poverty and preventing uh, poverty. Um, and we need to ensure that um, the whole process of transfer of powers is done in such a way that uh, there's no uh, disruption to the administration of um, that, that, that vital financial support that, that families rely on. So those kind of er areas where there's some, some early warning signs that suggest that there is, there is scope for strengthening the, the framework for how governments cooperate. Um, uh, three examples, some of which have been already highlighted in the, the, the Clark's um, note to the committee, but the, the dispute over whether 18 to 21 year olds um, will continue to be entitled to support with housing costs within universal credit in Scotland. Um, the concern over whether commitments to use universal credit flexibilities in Scotland to abolish the bedroom tax uh, can, be, can be implemented within the universal credit uh, system, um, given that they may lift some claimants above the, 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 the UK benefit cap. Uh, and thirdly, the, the nature of the draft regs that are currently out for consultation from the Scottish Government um, to give effect to what's a very welcome uh, policy intent to ensure that um, Universal credit can be paid twice monthly and paid direct to landlords um, where that's the choice of the claimant. Um, th those draft regs are, are drafted in such a way that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap between what they actually achieve uh, and what the policy intent is. And that throws up the question, is part of the reason for that because of the, um, the need for um, or the, the negotiation, the need for compromise between the two governments? Because they're a different kind of social security regulation than, you would ex than we would expect to see if it, uh, under the current uh, system. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll maybe pick up on that in the next panel. Bill Scott? Yeah, I, again, I'm, I have to speak as an outsider. Um, colleagues in Social Security Directorate tell me that relations are very good and you know, uh, they're certainly been productive in terms of the implementation of some of the powers. But I, you know, I'd, I'd echo, echo the points that John's made uh, about housing be benefit for 18 to 21 year olds, the new the new regulations around universal credit, et cetera. Um, I'd also say there's two different cultures at, at work and, and that may pose problems in the future. Um, you know, just in the, in, in the last wee while, um, job centre closures uh, in Glasgow and wider across Scotland um, and changes to personal independence payment entitlement. Um, both of these really have been done without any form of consultation whatsoever preceding the decision. <laughs> and, and that's a very different approach to the, the one that's been adopted by the Scottish Government, which was to engage directly with claimants, hear their views, and then try and formulate policy. Um, and you know, we're told, and, and we hope it will work out that way, that you know, the, no, the new Social Security powers will be used in both a spirit of co-production and to try to make that work in practice. And that co-production is that the users of the service should have a say in how uh, the service is delivered. And I think you know, that, that is going to pose ongoing difficulties uh, if areas that are reserved are exercised without you know, a cautious approach because they will have impact on the devolved powers also and, and uh, impact on the benefits administration in Scotland. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just welcome Chris Lowe? I know you get held up in traffic, Chris, so thank you very much for coming along. Um, I'll open it up now. Pete Wishart, you wanted to come in? Yes, well, thank you. And just of all, I think it's just worth noting um, how delighted and pleased the Scottish Affairs Committee are, um, are to join you this morning. It's the first time we've held any sort of joint session between the Scottish Affairs <clears throat> and a committee of the Holyrood Parliament. So we're really looking forward to this joint work and we're particularly looking forward to welcoming you all down to Westminster next week and can also thank you all of you very much for your opening remarks. I want to pick up a, a couple of remarks that Mr Scott made and that was about the different approach and cultures 
and how that will therefore have an impact and an effect about how these services will be delivered and the prospect of tensions possibly emerging because of the different way and perspective that both governments have about social security delivery. Is it something that either of you are, are noting in the people that you work with? What are your major concerns about these tensions as we go forward and what can both governments do and civil servants who are engaged in delivering this, this project do to try and ensure that some of that is, is offset? I'll start with you, Mr Scott, because you yeah. raised this. I mean, I accept that there are different political approaches um, in, by both governments, and that, that's fine in some ways. Um, but to take the example of um, housing benefit or ho housing allowance um, within universal credit um, and 18 to 21-year-olds, Scottish Government had said in advance that they wanted to mitigate the impact of that, and they wanted to take measures to, to do so. Just on that, can, what's your understanding about where we are with this? Because this does seem to be a flashpoint that's emerged in the course of the past few weeks. What's, where, where are we with this? And, and what is being done to try and ensure that these type of emerging issues are going to be dealt with effectively? Well, you know, as, as I say, as, as far as I'm aware, Scottish Government had let the UK Government know that they intended to take measures to mitigate the impact of uh, the abolition of housing benefit and housing allowance for 18 to 21 year olds, but it needed time to do so. In other words, these you know, um, computer systems need to be uh, changed. Uh, you know, you, you have to take action to actually be able to deliver on what you're promising will happen when, when a change like this in regulations or entitlement takes place. So you have to be given the time that it takes to take those administrative measures to have a system in place that ensures when the change takes place, the 18 to 21 year olds that you intend to protect tend to mitigate the loss uh, for that they are actually protected. Instead of which we've now got a time scale of less than one month <laughs> for that to take effect, which completely undermines local authorities and Scottish Government's attempts can to make it. Can I just ask Professor McEwen, just basically on this point, <clears throat> there's not just this as an example, there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, the bedroom tax and the benefit cap and the tensions and relationship between those that seem to be another potential or actual live problem. I mean, in your, in your view and, and, and what you've observed, how are both governments been able to reconcile some of these difficulties and differences? Um, well, they don't appear to have it at the moment. Um, I think with the, with the issue of the benefit cap, if I mean, I, 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 had, I didn't see a minute from the last ministerial working group, so I don't know if that's available, but um, I saw the minister's evidence to the, the Social Security Committee, um, which seemed to suggest that um, the the, the, there seemed to be a, a difference of view on whether or not the benefit cap would be um, altered in order to accommodate policy change that the Scottish Government wanted to make. If that were the case, then that seems to me to be a clear breach of the Fiscal Framework Agreement. If that is the case, then there is a process within the Fiscal Framework Agreement to raise that issue um, as as a dispute and as an issue under no detriment. Um, but we, I don't know enough about it. That, that's just going, going on what the information that we know to date. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the issue around housing benefit is, is an interesting one, and it does seem to me to be one of timing in particular. There isn't enough time to, to, to do anything um, different. But I was also a little surprised, and, and I, guess, I guess this might also be about timing, that um, this housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds was always the issue that um, I had understood would be an exemplary area where the Scottish Government could, were it inclined to do so, use the powers to create new benefits. To Rather than try to do something that was complex and technical through amending or mitigating existing UK benefits to enter into the arena itself with a new benefit. Now, there clearly isn't time uh, to do that um, on, on the, the timescales that Bill was referring to there. 
Um, but in the longer term, um, it, that, that seems to be a, a possible route, but I haven't seen it discussed um, anywhere in, in anything that the Minister said. John Dickens, do you want to come in? Yes, no, I, mean, I think what this flags up is how important it is to have clearer processes, transparent processes in place to, that set out at what point um, each government um, will engage with the other government when it has a policy um, that may um, either directly or indirectly interact, overlap, um, effect, impact on the, the, the policy of the other government. So in this case, we have the UK government with a policy in relation to removing entitlement from uh, the housing element of universal credit for um, many 18 to 21 year olds. should stress that it's, it's, it's housing, ho the housing element of universal credit. So actually those receiving housing benefit who are 18 to 21, this doesn't affect. It's, it's those who, um, will, uh, who, who become eligible for the new, um, who, who in this case won't become eligible for the, 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 the housing element of universal credit. Um, so there was, a, there was a policy intention there. There was clearly a known policy intention from the Scottish Government in relation to wanting to maintain um, uh, th that support for 18 to 21-year-olds in Scotland. I can't see, and we can't see externally, at what point um, it, was ex it would be expected that the governments would um, engage on that issue and seek to understand what the implications are and what p the potential workarounds might be that Nicholas flagged up one potential workaround if it's not possible within the, um, the actual powers specifically relating to um, flexibilities within universal credit. So what it flags up for us is that, 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 that pro getting this process right, it's absolutely clear to everybody in each government and externally at what point um, and, and our, I suppose our point would be that this flags up, that that should be as early as that, absolutely early as possible so we don't find ourselves in the situation that a month before um, uh, 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 um, eligibility changes, um, we have this kind of confusion as to what the situation will be for um, uh, young people in Scotland, confusion, potential confusion for them and for those people who are advising them and for housing providers. Yeah. Ian Murray, you wanted to come in on the back of that one? Just on the back, thank you very much, <coughs> convener. Um, uh, Professor McEwen, you mentioned the issue around the complicated nature of no detriment and fiscal framework and how all that fits together. Do, do you think there's an understanding of that in terms of the two working groups that are coming together? Because it's quite clear that if the Scottish Government uh, so wished to use the example of 18 to 21-year-olds and put in an additional benefit or a top-up, that it wouldn't be included in the benefit cap. So is there a clear understanding that uh, from both of the working parties that are coming together to try and resolve some of these issues, that they can, they can do that on the basis that that's their starting point, rather than, the, it seems to me as if there's a bit of a throwing up of smoke, rather than trying to, for the two groups to come together and try and resolve some of these complicated issues. I, I think you would need to ask the working groups themselves if I can't testify to their understanding. Um, but. I mean, it may, it may well be, that John's quite right, of course, is this is about flexibilities within universal credit, and it may well be that that, that makes for a more complicated uh, situation um, than the one that I set out. Um, I, think, I think there's a quite a, 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 an important distinction between the power to create a new benefit mm. and the power to top up an existing benefit, and sometimes these two are, are, are put together, um, and I... I, I Politically, I see very little um, attraction in, in topping up uh, existing benefits, and I think I imagine that that would raise many of the same complications as we're talking about here, because you would be trying to operate within um, the UK benefit system rather than creating something fresh and something new, where there was greater scope for designing it in the way that you wanted to design it. But that's clearly a longer term, a longer term issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, again, timing uh, is, is important here. You can't just create a new benefit and introduce it and implement it mm -hmm. uh, within, within a couple of months. John Dickey. Yes, I mean, I suppose just, again, it's another example of maybe the need for more clarity and transparency in terms of the, the, the process. It doesn't seem to clear to us given the, the fiscal framework and the, 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 the agreements that have been made through the um, Smith Commission and, 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 and since, that there is a, a bar that the benefit cap creates a barrier um, or, uh, in itself. That, that would be a breach of the, um, the, the fiscal framework. So, what, so then it's like, what, what, what is the issue? 
and um, you know, externally, externally, we can't we can't see that. Um, you know, uh, you know, is it a difficulty in terms of operational issues? Is it a difficulty in terms of technical issues? And we're sort of left, I suppose, guessing that that must be what the situation is. Actually, the barrier is one: how does within the universal credit um, system, the operational system, take account of the fact that in Scotland um, people will be getting um, uh, uh, additional support that would otherwise have taken them above the benefit cap, but that that shouldn't kick in in Scotland? Is that a technical operational issue that's creating the problem? Um, and I suppose it's just that, that, that I suppose that's about the transparency that presents. Wait, how do we, how, we? We are not seeing externally what the issue is, and that's leading to no question about that. It's leading to, 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 to confusion, and if it's leading to confusion for us, then more worryingly, it's leading to confusion for people for whom this is a you know, potentially a, a vital source of financial support, uh, and to those who are trying to advise them as well. Scott, you wanted to come in on that? Just very briefly, um, one, one of the issues, for example, will be that it's the DWP who will know who is affected by the, by, by the abolition of the entitlement and can pass on those details to Scottish Government, local authorities, etc. And without that level of cooperation, you'll, so information sharing is, 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 is uh, in Cass's pa paper to yourselves. I think it's a really, really important issue um, that information has to be shared to allow Scottish Government to utilise its powers in the way that was envisaged, whereas if the DWP holds on to that information and won't share, share it, then Scottish Government has great difficulty in, in taking measures to mitigate things like this. Thank you very much. Ben McPherson, did you want to come in on the back of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Supplementary. Then it's Alison Johnson. Just uh, coming in on, on, on some of the themes, Ian Murray raised the, the theme around complications, and, and Professor McEwen, you, you raised it, the issues yourself and also around timing, but I really wanted to focus on something that, uh, in a related way, that what uh, John Dickey said around the, the, the claimants. Um, John Dickey and Bill Scott, do you believe that the people you represent um, uh, in terms of your organisations? have an understanding of the complexities and the time needed to ensure both policies and legislation is in place before the benefits can be transferred and delivered by the Scottish Government? Um, straightforward, no. Um, I think it's, it's very, very difficult for people to get a handle on the benefit system as it was, uh, far less how it's going to be in the future. Um, many, many people think you know, local authorities because they deliver some benefits that they're responsible. <coughs> DWP are responsible, um, etc. They don't know where to go at times. And I think that that problem will be magnified when there are three or more agencies delivering benefits. And, and it becomes incredibly important then that communications between those organisations are extremely good. I mean, to give you one example, you know, a case that's recently come in front of myself. A disabled man wanted to go back into work, so he, he, he uh, wanted to go into um, permitted work, which is under 16 hours a week, under you know, a, a maximum amount that he can earn. So he notified his lo local job centre of that. And um, lo and behold, a month after he starts, his benefits are stopped. He's told that he's working over the, the hours threshold, but he's given all that information to the local job centre. He goes back to them and says, you know, I've given you this information. They say, yeah, we've got it, but we've passed it on to another job centre because that decision-making is centralised. <laughs> so he, they con he and his welfare rights worker contact the other job centre. They say, no, it's not us, it's another one. He has, to go, he has to contact four job centres before he, he can get the matter resolved and he goes without his benefits for over a month, endangering his employment, uh, etc. That's within the current system. <laughs> you know, that's the complexity that are there just now with centralisation, etc. and call centres handling uh, issues. So I, I, th I think there will be a huge amount of confusion when, when the new system comes into being about who people are dealing with. I appreciate that in terms of when we get to the point of delivery, there will need to be uh, awareness raised around uh, where the provision is coming from. I absolutely understand and uh, agree with that. I just wonder is very, this a, is it a very brief supplementary from previous. Indeed, yeah. Um, yeah I just uh, is, is there an awareness that um, both the policies and the legislation needs to be in place before the the process can transfer in, in terms of the the benefits 
uh, in question uh, in, in terms of the Scottish Government delivering instead of the DWP? Um, I'm not sure if I quite caught the, 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 I mean, this was just picking up the, 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 the general point. I, um, I think um, Echo Bill, clearly, the general public claimants, it, it, it's, it's complicated anyway. Introducing another, you know, split, splitting the, you know, two, two, two governments responsible for two bits of the social security system. There's a risk of that further complicating things. I think again, just to come back, what, what can we do about this? Um, what, what systems need to be put in place to ensure that we mitigate the risk to claimants um, and those who advise them and support them being further confused? Um, and I suppose that struck me that there's, there's scope for building on the memorandum for understanding that, 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 that's there just now to be more specific about the whole range of areas in which the two governments need to cooperate and the terms in which that they will cooperate. So that's right from, we've talked about the policy inception stage, but right through to the co communications and the communications with, <coughs> with claimants stage. And I think that's where there's scope to, to build on um, that, that memorandum, memorandum of understanding um, and really... Um, spell out what the, the commitment is from each of the governments and how they work together to get those communications right to, to avoid that, that, that level of confusion. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Dickey. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, Bill Scott spoke of um, two different cultures at work, um, but here we are in a situation where I think there's probably not precedent for powers in a devolved area of responsibility requiring such extensive cooperation and joint working. Um, and I'd just like to explore what challenges you think this poses. I mean, we have you know, one government that refers to welfare, the other to social security. There do seem to be different views. Um, up in that yes, um, you know, I think there's a different culture, not just um, at you know, a political level. There's a different culture at an operational level which is, is going to be quite difficult. I know we've not got them in operation yet, but we've already got the Scottish Government talking about um, people using uh, the social security system in Scotland being able to have choice about how they communicate with mm -hmm. the social security agency so that they can be able to use the means most appropriate to themselves, which, by the way, is in line with equality law. <laughs> that's what that's what uh, any service should be doing. They should be making themselves available to be contacted in as many formats as possible. So by telephone, by paper, online, as is needed by the person. And instead of which at DWP, you've got a digital by default approach for universal credit, which penalises people with learning difficulties, people with sensory impairments, etc. Um, and and you've got you've got the hypocrisy, actually, I, I have to say this, of the DWP saying you have to communicate by, to, with us online, but refusing to communicate with a blind claimant by email, <laughs> even though they, they've said that's the only way I can read your communications. The DWP refused to email the person. They say it has to be in, on paper. You know, that, you, as I say, that, that sort of different cultural approach is not only going to create tensions for the claimants, it's going to cause a huge amount of confusion. <laughs> um, you know, I can do this with this social security agency, but I can't do that with the DWP. How are they to know that? Um, how are they to know that the different approaches won't work um, with the different agencies? So I, I do think that this, you know, the cultures do need to be addressed. <laughs> Did you want to go in the back of that particular one? Can I just ask, um, I mean, as constituency MPs in, the, in England, we have all sorts of problems with uh, the DWP and the benefits agencies with our constituents. What level of difficulties does the Scottish agencies have with the DWP? Is it the same stresses and complications that we have as constituency MPs with the English DWP and other agencies? Thank you. Well, 
Maybe First something thing else. That one. Both, both questions, really. I mean, we're, CPG are on record our concerns about the direction of UK social security policy and the stresses that's creating for uh, ordinary families in and out of work claimants um, across across the UK. But, you know, that's a, that's a huge matter of concern, uh, and we're. We work hard uh, with colleagues across the UK to seek to influence the direction of UK um, social security policy. Um, clearly, there is a, a policy divergence. There's a, a divergence in terms of the approach to social security that's been taken in Scotland uh, and the rest of the UK. Um, and there's a whole lot of opportunities in that for, for us in this parliament um, to take a different approach to social security, but clearly only within very um, specific um, bits of the system that have actually been devolved. So there's a need to find a way of recognising uh, in the way that the government's cooperate and ensure that the cooperation happens in such a way that, just, that, 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 that recognises and works around those clearly current policy divergence. I mean, one way, looking again at the, 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 the memora memorandum of understanding that's in place at the moment, one way perhaps of doing that is being a bit more clear and explicit about what's the purpose of this memorandum of understanding. Uh, and for us, the purpose should be absolutely clear that it's about ensuring um, the needs of, of claimants and claimants come first, that the, the purpose of working together um, across the two, so, the two social security systems um, will be to ensure that uh, claimants get the financial support they're entitled to in a timely uh, way and that everybody across both governments is working to that end. Now there's some reference I think in bits of the memorandum under understanding to um, the need for cooperation and the aim of cooperation being to ensure the best possible out outcomes but quite far down in sort of paragraph 11 I think it is in 10.4 but it's not bringing that to the forefront and putting that at the forefront of what, what is the purpose of this cooperation would be at least a starting point in trying to um, uh, to, to work around and work with these um, clear tensions between the, the two approaches. Do you want to come in, Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the difficulty emerges when the two governments have different views of what the needs of claimants are. Um, and where this might emerge as a particular difficulty for a transitional period is when you move forward with this splitting of legislative and executive competence around... Um, the disability benefits, which I understand has been part of the agreement so far. Um, and I, I, I can't propose an alternative way to do it. I mean, I think mm. you, you have to have that, that, that time to enable a legislative process to unfold prior to taking on the responsibility for, for delivery and executive decision making. But it does seem to me that that's a time period where there will have to be very careful um, oversight of the relationship between the two governments um, and uh, very good communication be between them to make sure that there is nothing taking place under the executive authority which will make it difficult to implement, implement the legislation uh, further down the line. Yeah. No, Scott, did you want to come in on that? No, I <laughs> very much agree with that. <coughs> you know, we, we accept that it will take time to put the, the legislation and regulations in place. It's a very complex system, and we want to be sure that, as, we, as is not happening with, with housing allowance, that on day one, when Scottish Government begins to deliver benefits to disabled people, that nobody misses out because the system in place isn't good enough to, to ensure that. So we have to take the correct amount of time to make sure it is a system that works. But at the same time, there are massive changes happening to personal independence payment, which you uh, were not envisaged when the Smith Commission uh, were in place. Some of the changes that, that are taking place were envisaged, but these ones that have been brought in in the last few weeks were not envisaged, and that will reduce the amount of money coming to Scotland and therefore reduce the Scottish Government's ability to make sure that people with mental health issues, people with learning difficulties, mm -hmm. are treated on an equitable, equitable basis as those with physical impairments. Um, and I, I, don't, I just don't think that that is a fair situation where somebody that cannot go out because they've got severe psychological problems, cannot go out unaccompanied, is going to be stranded in their home because there is no money available to uh, get them a taxi mm -hmm. uh, and go out with a companion. Yeah. Absolutely. I just wanted to say before to bring Alison Johnson back in again, the rollout of universal credit has very problematic up here and we're calling for a halt uh, on what's happening because we've seen people in debt as soon as they go into universal credit. So maybe we can have a chat when we see you next, next week at Westminster. Sorry, Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, I think... <laughs> 
Bill Scott's point there, I mean, I accept that the relevant sections of the Scotland Act haven't yet been commenced, but I think a lot of people have been very surprised about the extensive changes that have been made to DLA and PIP. And the point you make there, um, recently the UK government overturned a ruling via tribunal, which means that people suffering from mental health conditions, which make it difficult for them to travel on their own, now need to, to score points to qualify for PIP. It just seems to me that this goes against the spirit of the devolution settlement. Would you agree? I, I, do, I do tend to agree because, you know, I think negotiations took place in good faith. We, you know, uh, we were led to believe what the outcome would result in, in terms of the amount of money coming to Scotland. We did point out, I have to say at the time, that because it would take quite a while before DLA, DLA and PIP did come to Scotland, that a lot of um, people would experience loss in, in that period. But there have been changes since then. These two uh, upper tribunal decisions um, should have resulted in people with mental health issues, people with learning difficulties, and a small group of other people um, receiving uh, the uh, higher rate mobility component of um, personal independence payment. But now they won't. And, and at the time when uh, the... Um, bill to introduce personal independence payment was going through the Lords, um, the government minister gave a commitment that actually <laughs> they would be getting treated on a more equitable basis alongside those with physical impairments than ever before. Um, and, and that is not now going to materialise. And that, that means a lot of people that expected to qualify for personal independence payment won't. And they will have lost that benefit before the Scottish government has the new powers. And it will have a reduced budget with which to make up the difference. And that you know, does not seem fair to, to, to ourselves. Does any other panel want to come in on that particular one? Uh, no, I suppose, again, just trying to think how do we, what, what needs to be put in place to try and deal with this as, 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 as best as, as possible. So I agree, again, the concern about the policy itself, but it's what, what point, there's nothing clear in the current MOU that I could see or my understanding of how arrangements work that spells out the point and, and the scope, the, the, the points at which UK government, in this case, the UK government has changed its policy in relation to disability benefits, is clearly going to have an impact and implications for devolved policy in this area as powers are transferred in terms of cost, in terms of the impact, all the rest of it. Um, what point do they engage with Scottish government to flag up that this is the policy intention and that they are committed to, um, that, well, what we argue that they should be, that there should be something in place that ensures that they're committed to um, reviewing the implications for um, uh, social security policy in Scotland from a change in social security policy at UK level, and vice versa, because as social security policy in Scotland develops, there'll be implications for UK social security, and it needs to be at a very early stage. I think it needs to be set out quite clearly what the, the, the point at which. Uh, not just information is shared, so it's not just about saying we're going to do this, it's about saying this is the policy intent and there's a process to go through in terms of reviewing what the implications are for the other government social security programmes. And I think that, as far as we can see, doesn't seem to be there very clearly at the moment and that's why we're ending up very close to the point that change is happening and confusion being there. Um, I suppose that, that, one? that um, addresses directly the point I was trying to make in my first remarks, which is about the need for... Um, a, a forum like the Joint Ministerial Working Group um, to think for the longer term beyond the point of implementation and to have a process in place where you can ensure that there is communication early on. But I wanted to make a, a, a broader point about the money. Um, and I think there are clearly issues um, in this transitional period when policies that will be devolved are altered pre-devolution, because that, that absolutely affects um, the, the fiscal transfer at point of devolution. But there are also going to inevitably be ongoing difficulties, even if there was no policy change at the UK government level, because of the agreement um, to um, on block grant adjustment for welfare um, to be barnetised, then um, where there is uh, disproportionate spending obligation under these current um, spending uh, within Scotland because of the disproportionate need, that's not going to be taken into account under a Barnet system. Now, 
when you do have policy change and that reduces entitlement still further, then there are knock-on effects on the block grant. Um, and there will, it seems to me, be very difficult um, financial issues to deal with for the Scottish Government um, at, at the point post-devolution. Uh, very much. Alison Johnson, Adam Tompkins. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning. Um, can, I, can I just say first, I mean, I, I, I very much want to see um, good, close, cooperative working at official and at ministerial level between the two governments, and also good, close cooperation at parliamentary level in terms of holding both the governments to account. So I very warmly welcome uh, <coughs> the members of the House of Commons here and the, the, the fact that this is the first Holyrood Committee to be working jointly with the Scottish Affairs Committee in trying to understand the complexity of this uh, new um, adventure in, new experiment in uh, shared government or joined up government, to use an old phrase in a different context, uh, that, 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 that we're seeing. And with that in mind, I've got one or two questions that might perhaps be particularly directed at Professor McEwen, but I'd also very much welcome Bill Scott's and John Dickey's reflections on them if they, if they have any. And the, the first question really is, I mean, we've heard quite a lot this morning about the policy differences that exist between the UK government and the Scottish government. And of course, there's nothing in devolution is there to suggest that the UK government and the Scottish government cannot or should not have uh, policy differences, or indeed that um, devolution somehow prevents uh, either government from changing and adapting their policies in accordance with how they assess uh, need um, uh, to, to, to be changing. So if we can just put some of the policy differences to one side for a moment and just think about the system. Um, is the system of joint ministerial working that, we, that we've got in the UK and that is under development in the UK um, fit for purpose when uh, we know that we have different governments in different parts of the UK with, in some respects, quite radically divergent policy needs? And if it isn't uh, fit for purpose, what sorts of reforms to that system do you think we need to see in order to make it fit for purpose? Your question is no. Um, and in terms of what reforms we need to see, there's clearly, as you, as you know, there are different types of forums. So there, there are the multilateral forums under the auspices of the Joint yeah, Ministerial but, but Committee. I'm, I'm talking specifically about social security. Right, okay. Well, I'll come back to that though. Um, and then the bilateral forums, which are new. And it seems to me that the bilateral forums have been set up uh, to deal with transfers of powers. Um, the Joint Exchequer Committee is probably a bit further down the line because it's been in existence for longer in terms of dealing with ongoing issues and there's probably something to learn from that um, around the, the, the path ahead for the, the Joint Ministerial Working Group if that is to exist for the longer term um, as an ongoing management issue. But some of the social security issues will be also for the Joint Exchequer Committee because a lot of the issues that emerge will be financial and under the auspices of the Fiscal Framework Agreement. Um, there may well be a, a, um, the, the appeal or the possibility of, of a multilateral forum dealing with welfare issues going forward. I know that that's been uh, discussed um, by a number of colleagues when this has come up about trying to find a purpose for the Joint Ministerial Committee beyond just chat and communication. Um, however, uh, I'm not sure that the, the, the current um, incarnation of the GMC for European negotiations that has a purpose, that had a purpose, is necessarily um, um, a, a sign of good things to come um, in, in that respect. So I think, uh, going back to your first point, yes, absolutely, D devolution has to come with different mandates, different, different policy directions for both governments. And I think that the difficulty that we have here is that the design of the devolution system in the Scotland Act 2016 does add significantly to the complexities and the interdependencies. And that's new in the devolution settlement. And that's why there is a need, I think, uh, to have more robust systems and possibly also with more robust dispute arbitration systems. Because the way that these have been designed so far uh, seems to me to encourage uh, indecision or non-decision or disputes that emerge that can't be resolved will simply fall and there may be inaction. There's always been a reluctance on the part of both governments to have uh, independent arbitration um, and that may be something that, that we can look at again. 
Mr. Sco Sorry, Mr. Tompkins. Mr. Scott, did you want to come in on? Yeah, yeah, just minutes? very briefly. It's a, it's a practical example. We have, we have been making this point before, but because of the split in the benefits that have been transferred, means-tested benefits, universal credit, income support, etc., all remain at Westminster. So the potential exists that if the Scottish Government extends entitlement to disability benefits or carers allowance, that premiums that are awardable under certainly the means-tested benefits, will the number of those premiums awarded will rise, which will have a knock-on consequence for the UK Government in terms of the amount it's paying out, which is likely to lead to, under the fiscal framework, clawback. So that potential already exists. Um, and uh, you know, it's because of the, the, the nature of the split, it's more likely, <laughs> because, because those premiums are awarded because you're a, a disabled person or because you're a carer, that it's the Scottish Government that are going to end up on the wrong end of the fiscal framework and losing money than it's the UK Government uh, that, that ends up losing it. Um, so, you know, I, I think th this is going to be, cause ongoing difficulties uh, over time, and it, it's partially due to that split. Come in, Mr Dickey, on, on that particular Not to point. add a huge amount, I suppose much of what I was saying in relation to how the um, framework for the officials engaging with each other and the need to identify the scope for that engagement and the points in the process, policy development process, that, that they will engage with each other would apply to sort of joint ministerial working at political level as well, that clear um, agreement between the uh, uh, political level at what point they will, uh, they're committed to sharing, engaging with each other about the potential implications of their own um, areas of social security policy on each other. I think that needs to be sort of clarified and brought out um, and, and sort of agreed um, uh, sooner rather than later. Thanks. To, to break, to yeah, just, uh, just, to, just to develop one or two of these points a little bit more, if I may. Um, so uh, if the uh, Joint Ministerial Working Group for Welfare is not fit for purpose, what kinds of reforms to it do we need to see in order to make it fit for purpose? And uh, you mentioned, Professor McEwen, that the Joint Exchequer Committee may be an example in terms of bilateral relations from which the Joint Ministerial Working Group may usefully learn. Well, what are the lessons from the Joint Exchequer Committee that the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare should be learning? My point about intergovernmental relations systems or uh, processes being not fit for purpose was a more general one. Right. Um, I can't tell you precisely about the Joint Ministerial Working Group because it doesn't have sufficient transparency for me or perhaps even this committee to be able to tell uh, and make that judgment. Um, I think that there may well be lessons within the Joint Exchequer Committee simply because it has gone beyond the point of, tra of transfer. Um, and it meets, I, I, I can't remember how often it meets, a couple of times a year, I think, now. Um, Again, I don't know um, enough about what goes on in that process to be able to say preci precisely uh, what the lessons would be to learn, but I think it's worth looking at, and there's clearly um, relationships between the two that would have to develop because social security is also a financial issue. Um, and I think that's where most of the difficulties on an ongoing basis and possible disputes to emerge will lie. Can I get one very more quick? One, one thank small you for being very generous, Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, just, I mean, clearly this isn't the only country in the world uh, with multi-layer government mm -hmm. where different levels of government um, point in different political directions. So mm -hmm. are there any lessons that we can learn from other multi-level democracies that manage or have managed the processes of uh, intergovernmental working in social security specifically for longer than we have in the United Kingdom? Directly to I, I, think <laughs> I, th I think it's difficult um, because there is no other country in the world that has the degree of asymmetry that we have in the UK where you have, so, so you will have examples of federal governments engaging with um, provincial governments or state governments or whatever it is um, on social security and other issues but I can't think of an example of, of an intergovernmental or multi-layered system that has a federal government simultaneously acting for the largest part of the population of the state. Um, so th that, that instills 
um, a degree of hierarchy into our system of intergovernmental relations, which is difficult uh, to design out, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's, that's part of, the, part of the system that's there. It's part of the dynamic that's there. And processes can help, um, but processes are one part, of the, the, the underlying thing, and then the politics uh, that emerges on top of that, and the relationships that emerge as a result of that are, are, are difficult. And it's a feature of the UK, and the UK is becoming more and more complicated, and we'll, we will have to find ways of managing it. If I find particular uh, practical suggestions, I would be very happy to share them with the committee. Thank you. But Bill Scott, you wanted to come Just in on that particular one. Brief way. point, Stormont has had um, social security power since about mm -hmm. 1920. 1921, but until very, very recently, haven't exercised those powers any differently from the UK government. And it's only in those recent years when they have exercised the powers differently, again, that the problems have emerged. And the, U the UK Treasury have been imposing uh, fines on uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly um, because it hasn't implemented parts of UK policy. And, and, and as a consequence, their fiscal framework has been affected. Thank you, Bill. Deirdre Brock, do you want to come in on a supplementary in that particular one? Uh, no, not supplementary. Oh, right. okay. uh, Margaret Ferrier. And then. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I just want to go back to a, a couple of the things that was mentioned at the start regarding the minutes, that occasionally you get minutes, and I think it's all to do with this lack of communication or that the communication could be much better. Uh, maybe, maybe you could tell us how communication can be improved between yourselves and these organisations and also between the DWP and the Scottish Government. Um, and secondly, um, apart from the... Um, Joint Ministerial Working Group and the, um, the Joint Senior Officials Group. We've got the Memorandum of Understanding. We've got the Concordat. Now, the Concordat obviously was set out um, to ensure that there was good working relationships between both the DWP and the Scottish Government. The last time that was updated was 2010. Is it, is it time for, for a further update? Because obviously we've now got the Scotland Act 2016. Come to you first, Bill. Oh, me first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the expert on intergovernmental working, I have to say. Uh, just, just, just probably, before... Yes, it, it's, it's certainly time for it to be updated. Um, uh, one thing I would say is I do think um, one of the things that we were very pleased about the Smith Commission uh, approach to um, negotiations was the involvement of civ civic society. Um, in the process and that there was a great deal of openness uh, actually. Um, I know there were internal negotiations but there was a lot of openness about the process and uh, about um, hearing the views of civic society uh, as well as negotiations between officials and uh, politicians. And I would like you know, that sort of approach, open government, <laughs> um, you know, where civic society actually does have a role uh, in, in, in our governmental uh, relations um, uh, because I think we do have a contribution to make to that and for that to work there has to be a certain level of openness and a wee bit more um, <laughs> in terms of minutes than as, as um, Nick has pointed out um, we get fairly sparse minutes of what, what was discussed and, and, and what was agreed sort of action points whereas we don't really get very much insight in, into maybe some of the detail that we probably do need to know about to a certain extent. Okay. Else? I think that the Memorandum of Understanding, I think, goes considerably beyond the 2010 Concordat anyway, uh, so I think that, that has to be seen as a positive. Um, on transparency, I mean, I think that it's, it's not about relationships between these processes and us. I think it's about relationships between those processes and parliaments. Um, so, and, and if, if that's transparent, then it's easier for everybody else to, to, to see as well. Um, the Scottish Parliament should be getting um, communication from the Scottish Government. There is a written agreement to uphold that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, with the, the minute of the last ministerial working group, um, if it's been published and I simply couldn't find it, that's entirely possible. Um, it's, it wasn't in your papers for this meeting either. Um, but 
in a, and it may be that there weren't minutes. So if, if there weren't, then there still should be communication from the Scottish Government to the Scottish Parliament on its participation in the intergovernmental process. Um, one example, and it's going back to the Joint Exchequer Committee's early days, um, where there was very extensive minutes um, around um, the discussions that took place between the two governments. And for me as a scholar, that was fantastic, and the roof never caved in. So um, when, when those minutes were published, and it's probably only people like us that are read, reading them. Um, so, I mean, I think the more extensive the minutes, the more accurate the minutes can be to... to to get not just what was agreed, but what was discussed and by whom, and to tr try and get a better understanding of where the issues lie, where the difficulties lie. I mean, I think the more that can be provided there, the better. And that also will enable you know, people like John and Bill, who, who have insights that maybe parliaments and governments don't have, to, to help to feed into the process and help to maybe overcome some of the difficulties as well. Well, certainly, just a small piece of information. As far as I know, it hasn't been published yet. We okay. certainly haven't seen it, so you haven't missed it. It's just not there. <laughs> um, John Dickey, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, it's not, I think, just echo what we said. I think if there had been perhaps more transparency and more opportunities to um, engage, to share what the thinking was, if there, or to share the, the, the cooperation and the, 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 the engagement that there had been around, for example, 18 to 21 year olds, universal credit facilities, if these things, if that discussion had been um, a bit more transparent or that, and, and, and there had been opportunities for external engagement and scrutiny of that, then perhaps some of the issues that have arisen wouldn't have arisen or we wouldn't be this late on in the process um, finding ourselves in that sort of situation where they're stuck. So I think, um, I think there is, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said that. I suppose, other, I'm not sure if it's directly related, the other um, area where we think the whole system could be supported and um, uh, the whole system for cooperation and, and, and uh, could be supported would be <coughs> through having an um, independent statutory scrutiny body that would look at both um, sort of policy developments in terms of devolved social security, but also in terms of draft regs draft legislation uh, and would be able to provide a level of uh, independent expert scrutiny that, uh, that both governments could then have confidence in that would take maybe take some of the heat out of the, the, the relationship, that, 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 that level of, sort of impartial expertise to be able to identify where there are implications for um, UK government, Scottish government, whichever <laughs> implications and vice versa in terms of policy being developed in one government uh, and potential implications for the other government's social area of social security. So having a, 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 an independent body along the lines of the kind of social security advisory committee model, but I think maybe evolving to, to deal with the, the um, issues of uh, um, split responsibilities for social security. I have two members who want to come in this up and then Deirdre Brock. Gordon Lindhurst, was that supplementary to the question there? Small um, it was to go back to a point that Professor McEwen made, but so I'm, I, I could perhaps raise it after uh, okay. Deirdre Brock. George Adam, did you want a supplementary on that particular point? I saw point what was just mentioned there after Margaret's question was, obviously the, uh, the panel have given us an expl explanation of a very complex, kind of difficult landscape, but as part of the problem, it's, it's not even political as such. We have the political issues, which are challenging as well, but there's also the fact that we seem to have DWP Westminster just bringing on, regardless, as, as if it's, it's business as usual. An example of which would be the job centre closures type idea, what happened just before Christmas, whereas the Scottish Government never knew about it. And in fact, the Minister came here and told us, Minister for Employment, that he read about it in the Daily Record before he actually heard anything else. So is it not a lot more, less complex than that, that we just have a, a system that just seems to kind of just want to bring John and continue and doesn't seem to be kind of looking at the modern kind of the processes that we currently have and the changes that are happening. I, I didn't mean to stop you, but I know that Deirdre Brock wanted to come in on that particular issue. Do you want to come in this up? <coughs> and then yeah, can I, 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 well, actually, further to that, um, I was going to raise that too, because uh, I just wondered, with your knowledge of the internal workings, if you like, of, of the political and operational teams, I think someone mentioned the operational teams seem to be ticking along fairly well at the moment. Uh, was it Bill, was it? Aha. Uh -huh. um, I wonder, you know, with whatever knowledge you've gleaned from those internal workings, um, how you thought that situation might have come about? I mean, 
just our minister finding that out in the in a newspaper um, and and not having obviously any sort of warning of that beforehand and 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 what lessons would you glean from that then um, and, and take forward into this situation specifically around social security um, I mean I don't know how that happened <laughs> I don't think that's, um, yeah. in terms of thinking how could we avoid those uh, that situation or those, those situations arising um, then it is about I think um, strengthening the whether we call it memorandum of understanding is that a new concord that's a new memorandum to be absolutely clear where DWP needs to um, um, engage with Scottish Government as policy is developed within DWP, and that that should be very early on, and it shouldn't be restricted just to those areas where um, there's a, 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 you know, devolution of... Um, uh, where, where powers are devolved, but also to those areas where um, policy, DWD policies say, will, 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 will sort of rub along and, and, and impact, even if it's not overlapping um, or, or, or with devolved areas of social security, that there does need to be um, a, a absolutely much clearer agreement that um, information will be shared about policy development uh, by DWP and vice versa. I mean, we're talking about it this way around, but as the thing develops, this will be something that works both ways. But at the moment, it is, it's, it's more that way. And another thing I suppose to say is it wasn't clear to us reading the memorandum of understanding. Clearly, there's, there's an agreement there between the uh, officials and different programme boards, and there's the DWP have a, um, a Scottish devolution programme board. But what the relationship between is between those programme boards and the actual programme boards within DWP that are responsible for driving forward bits of uh, policy, whether it's Job Centre Plus, or whether it's universal credit rollout, whether it's a, a clearer um, explanation um, within the memorandum, perhaps as an annex, about how those different programme boards um, relate to each other um, would be really important. Because I think we do have a concern that the Scottish Government programme boards are kind of one step removed from the, those bits of the DWP that are actually responsible for the day-to-day -day policy and operational um, uh, d d developments within, within the social security. So, so something that's clearer about how those all link together would be really helpful and might help to, tra might help to ensure that um, throughout DWP there's an understanding of the need to reflect on uh, the implications of, um, uh, of, of, of policy for um, devolved Scottish social security responsibilities. And I'm using the DWP example there because that's that's what's current. But this will this will make sense. This will be important both ways as the uh, as, as 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 the transfer of powers um, continues. Thank you, Nicola McHugh. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, the, there's nothing new in social security policy having an impact on devolved competence. Um, that's always been the case between the interface between social security and social policy. Um, and I wanted to draw the committee's attention attention to work done by the IFS recently on the changes that are coming um, to tax credits and uh, particularly for child tax credits and working families because uh, they will have an enormous impact on other areas of devolved competence, not the social security powers because those aspects of social security are not to be devolved, but on other areas of social policy and uh, with, with a knock-on effect there. Um, but on, on your point about how did that happen, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe that's a, a question for, for the panel to come, but it does seem to me there's been a lot of work within Whitehall, it seems to me, in the last few years um, to build up uh, expertise and knowledge of devolution. Um, one of the risks of that is that you have a, a group of officials within each department that work on devolution. And they probably have really good working relationships with the Scottish Government, and they probably communicate very well with their counterparts in the Scottish Government. But I'm not sure how then the rest of the officials within DWP will have an, you know, how, how much their understanding is also developing around issues of devolution where uh, their decision making and their policies will have uh, an impact. And that seems to be an internal Whitehall challenge, an ongoing one, given the mobility that takes place for, for officials, but it's maybe a question for the next panel. Absolutely. 
Bill Scott, do you want to come in? Very briefly, I just to echo that. I think the Health and Work Green paper that was issued by the DWP, there's nearly a mention of Scotland in it. Uh, and how, how um, the proposals would work in Scotland, even though a lot of it is about the DWP making referrals to the NHS. And, you know, we've had, we've had a devolved NHS since it was created <laughs> in Scotland. So, you know, the DWP couldn't do that um, without negotiation, etc. And I think exactly, it's a massive department, 88,000 people. I think, you know, a political decision was made to reduce the staff complement and the number of premises that DWP have, and then the operational decisions are made further down the line. Um, and I think that that is the problem with such a massive department um, that a lot, a lot of operational decisions are made elsewhere. And, and I would agree very much with Professor McEwen that they don't necessarily talk to each other about within the DWP about the relations with Scotland or even you know, what the devolution settlement means. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Gordon Linters. Oh. <laughs> well, we are running out of time. A very short supplementary then, Gordon Linters. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask um, our uh, witnesses today if they're aware of the experience panel that the Scottish Government um, is, is looking to recruit people with recent experience of benefits so that they get the system, the social security system in Scotland right working for so uh, is the panel aware of that and able to put it out to their um the people that they come in contact with Very much. we're trying to actively recruit disabled people who are in receipt of disability benefits to to go on to the experience panels because we think they're a fantastic opportunity for government policy to be informed by the end user and that is the way to reform services is to ask the people who rely on those services how they need to change and adapt to meet their needs. Quick yes or no from the panel. Uh, <laughs> we're aware thank of and uh, important development. Thank, thank you so much. We, we are running short of time. So, Gordon Linters, the last thank, question. Thank you, convener. Just uh, very quickly, Professor McCune, you mentioned possibility of arbitration, and I wouldn't want to dismiss that out of hand, but a, a lot of people would say ultimately decisions on these issues are political decisions. The Scottish Government, whatever political complexion it may have, the UK Government, uh, whatever political complexion it may have, may differ on these things. And I'm just wondering, um, even in systems where there isn't perhaps the imbalance in the size of the component nations of the, the unit, as it were, such as Germany, where there's a federal system, um, precisely the issues on social security and differences between the federal government and the local government, for example, the Bavarian government, have risen in the past two years. So whatever system is set up, there will be these differences. Um, but I think I'm just curious if you could develop your, your comment about arbitration or whether one could look at other countries and see how they resolve these differences that do arise in any event. I think it's, <clears throat> I suppose in other countries where there was more of a legal culture um, and there, there may be more of a role for constitutional courts, and Adam will know more about this than, than, than I do, so I won't say anything further. Um, but I wasn't necessarily advocating that. I think that I absolutely I agree with you that ultimately a lot of this will boil down to politics and it's appropriate for the political actors to resolve that or decide not to resolve that and take the consequences uh, with them. Uh, but some of it seems to me too technical um, and, uh, or, or at least open to interpretation. And again, we're going to go back to the Fiscal Framework Agreement time and time again because it was um, in some ways quite ambiguous still. Um, and maybe that was necessary to get that political agreement at the time um, that, that they needed to get it. Um, but I think it's at least open to interpretation and some interpretations will set precedents uh, for, for the future. And you may be right, it may be uh, more appropriate for the political actors rather than some independent arbiter, um, but at least if there is um, um, imp independent or impartial evidence basis uh, for them to then make those political decisions, that might help uh, the process further. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for staying that wee bit longer. I'm sure we can ask you lots and lots and more questions. But uh, I do have to bring this evidence session to a close. And uh, thank you for attending and answering uh, the questions. And I'll allow a few minutes for changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much. Um, we're on to our uh, second panel. And we we're welcome, very welcome to, to yourselves here. And I know that um, Mary Patterson, uh, you're replacing Richard Cornish. That's, That's yes. correct. And you have asked, uh, I think, both of you, uh, both groups, to make opening statements. So I'll pass it over to who wishes you to go first. Stephen, is that okay? Yes, sure. Okay. Convener, Chair. Members of both committees, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the work that we're doing in collaboration with the Department for Work and Pensions to implement the devolution of social security powers under the Scotland Act 2016. Social security will be, by any measure, the most complicated area of devolution ever undertaken by the Scottish Government. For me, the safe and secure transition of around £2.8 billion of annual benefit payments to approximately 1.4 million people living in Scotland depends on two important factors above all else. Firstly, a team of people across the Scottish Government who have the skills, the capabilities, the enthusiasm and the determination to succeed. And secondly, strong, constructive and effective working relationships with the UK Government, in particular our colleagues in DWP. That the committees have asked us to appear together to provide you with an update on our work so far is entirely in keeping with the fact that this is a joint endeavour by both governments. I've been the Director of Social Security for over 12 months now, and that time I've been focused on establishing the foundations that we need for devolution to succeed. So we've grown from a single division of around 30 people to a directorate of around 150, spanning the areas of policy, analysis, service design, operations, program management, digital, legal, HR, procurement and communications. I expect of around 200 people in post by the end of this year, with further significant expansion in the years to come as the new Social Security Agency begins to emerge. 
Within the directorate, we've sought to recruit the right people from across the Scottish Government and its agencies with the right skills and experience at the right time. We're building capability across our organisation now and for the future, providing training and support for colleagues taking on new and different roles. We've also recruited people permanently from a number of other UK government departments, including DWP, the Treasury, the Cabinet Office, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and the Ministry of Justice. And we've just advertised our first suite of posts externally, looking to attract in people from the wider public and private sector. The result will be a diverse team with strength in depth. Designing, building and testing new devolved services requires robust governance to support effective decision making by civil servants and ministers. A key member of my team is Lisa Baron Broadhurst, a civil servant with over 20 years experience in project and programme management. I'm delighted Lisa is able to join me today. As you might imagine, we've been busy since the Scottish parliamentary elections in May 2016. In July, we published a new future for social security. And in what was one of the most wide ranging consultations ever undertaken by the Scottish Government, over 120 engagement events took place and we met with people in every one of our 32 local authority areas. By the time the consultation closed at the end of October, we received 521 responses from a wide range of individuals and organisations. This is intended to provide ministers with a valuable and rich source of evidence which they can use over the next four years to guide the development of our work. And initially it will inform the Social Security Bill to be laid before summer recess, a key focus of activity in the directorate at the moment. I want to briefly say something about how my team is going about its work. Engagement with people, in particular those with lived experience of the services being devolved, is going to be crucial to our success. But we will be going further than the traditional approach officials usually take to stakeholder engagement. We plan to design and build our social security system hand in hand with those who will come to rely on this new public service. Of course, as you would expect, the civil service has a term for this. In the jargon, we call it co-production. In my view, it's just common sense. A good example of this is our experience panels, where we plan to recruit over 2,000 volunteers to guide our activity. I'm pleased to be able to let you know that after the first two weeks of a 10-week campaign, we've already recruited 550 people. The launch of the panels is important for another reason. It marks a significant milestone in our working relationship with DWP, who will be issuing letters on our behalf to a broad sample of people in receipt of devolved benefits tomorrow as the next phase of the campaign begins. The partnership between the two governments goes deeper than just my directorate and the teams which Mary and Pete lead. Our two executive teams met last year to underline the seriousness of their commitment to this work, and they'll meet again in the spring. That sends a clear signal to both organisations that only the right leadership culture, one where openness, trust and collaboration is encouraged, will help us meet and overcome the challenges ahead. Beyond these more formal occasions, intergovernmental cooperation in the area of social security happens on a number of fronts. Mary and I jointly chair a group of senior officials which supports the Joint Ministerial Working Group, which we've been talking about this morning. Together with the Scotland Office in those meetings, we progress key ministerial priorities, such as the commencement of the Scotland Act provisions and joint communications activity, and we look at our emerging programme of work. Indeed, on Thursday, the four of us here with you today met with our senior teams to review and discuss how we can work more effectively in the future. And every day, and it is every day, people from my directorate are speaking to people from the devolution teams and DWP are having joint workshops or meeting to progress this activity. As civil servants, we are guided in what we do by various things. So at a general level, we have the civil service code which sets out our values that we are expected to live and breathe each day. These are honesty, integrity, impartiality and objectivity. More specifically in Social Security, we have, mem we have a memorandum of understanding between the DWP and ourselves, which contains certain procedures that we have agreed to follow in a number of areas, such as information sharing. The MOU has been critical in cementing a close working relationship between our teams and building my directorate's knowledge and understanding of the benefit to be devolved. In closing, convener and chair, these remarks are not designed to be exhaustive, but I trust they provide you and members present with an insight into how the two governments are working well to achieve the safe and secure transition of social security powers from the UK government to the Scottish government. With your permission, I'll now hand over to Mary Patterson to make her opening remarks before we take your questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stephen. Convener, Chair, members of both committees, thank you for the opportunity to come here today to talk about the work that we're doing in DWP with, with Scottish Government colleagues to support the transfer of Social Security to powers to Scotland. The Scotland Act 2016 provided the legislative means for the UK Government to devolve power for over £2.8 billion of welfare benefits and payments for over a million Scottish citizens. But that's just the start, and we are now embarking on an ambitious undertaking to ensure the successful, secure and safe transfer of powers and responsibilities. And as Stephen has noted, success, success relies on strong working relationships between DWP and Scottish Government, underpinned by robust governance. DWP is committed to making a success of this. And since taking over the role of senior responsible owner, I've sought to build on the excellent working relationships developed by my predecessor, Richard Cornish, and to continue to share our learning and experience of running the UK social security system, to seek solutions, working collaboratively with Scottish Government as we work through the details of this joint endeavour. It is worth rehearsing the range of powers which the Scotland Act devolves to Scotland. These include the ability to create new benefits and make discretionary payments, responsibility for a range of DW, current DWP benefits, the ability to change certain defined elements of universal credit and powers to create new employment programmes. The key interest for both our governments is to deliver these powers securely, safely and smoothly. And it is essential that we ensure that Scottish customers receive high quality support. Stephen has already touched on the important governance arrangements we have in place, which include the joint ministerial working group on welfare and joint, joint meetings of officials between DWP and S Scottish Government, including at the executive team level, to share knowledge and experience at the most senior levels. DWP is investing significant resource to take this this forward. Pete and I have dedicated policy and programme teams in place to support devolution of powers and they draw on expertise from across the department to ensure the work is given appropriate priority. Alongside this work we have shared our extensive corporate knowledge and expertise of design and delivery of welfare benefits to help build capability and understanding of this complex area. We've shared over 300 pieces of information with Scottish Government on our business processes, customer journeys, and arranged well in excess of 100 meetings and workshops delivered to explain the processes in more detail. We are also building capability and understanding within DWP on the devolution settlement and how and when to engage with Scottish Government in this new landscape. There's been significant progress to date. The first transfer of powers covering 11 of the 13 social security sections of the Scotland Act took place July 2016. As a result of close cooperation, progress has been made on a number of early priorities, including new devolved employment support, Work Able Scotland and Work First Scotland, to be launched from April this year. These services will use existing DWP systems to underpin delivery. And work is now focused on the remaining two sections of the Act, covering existing benefits for disability, industrial injuries, carers, maternity, funeral and heating expenses. At the request of Scottish Government Ministers and agreed at the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, DW DWP is progressing an innovative, un unprecedented approach to commencing these remaining sections by splitting the competence. This will allow the Scottish Government space to legislate for its new arrangements, but the UK Government will remain accountable for delivery during the transition period up to 2020. And we are on track to lay the regulations in April. Also, at the request of Scottish Government, we have completed a feasibility study exploring options to deliver a carer's allowance increase in Scotland, and I know Scottish Government are considering those initial findings. And as Stephen mentioned, we've also supported the experience panels with the mailing that's going out tomorrow. So in summary, whilst our two governments might not always share the same view or policy approach, our aim is to work closely and constructive at all levels to find solutions to the challenges presented. Good progress has been made to date, but there is obviously further to go. And we, this will begin to take shape as we see government, the Scottish Government's Social Security Bill and we work with Scottish Government officials and colleagues as they shape their new system. A close, constructive and productive relationship with Scottish Government is at the heart of delivering the new powers in a successful, secure and safe way. And I look forward to continuing to build on the good work that we've already made to date. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Nick.
I was remiss at my op not to mention um, Lisa Baron Broders, uh, Programme Director, Social Security Director at the Scottish Government, and Peter Sale, uh, Director, Working Age Benefit and Evolution Director at the Department for Work and Pensions. Welcome. I'm very sorry I um, remiss of me not to mention you at the very beginning. C could I just perhaps kick off on uh, one of the questions which asked the previous panel, and they certainly had uh, a good overview about it in regards to working relationships. Now, you've said yourself that you work in partnership. I think Stephen Kerr mentioned that. But also, Mary Patterson, you mentioned the fact that although you're, both governments may have a different way of looking uh, at it, i.e. Westminster looks at wealth, welfare, we in the Scottish Government, social security based on dignity and respect. Now, in that respect, you have two different political masters, I may, if I may call it, with different views on the way you call social security or welfare and how you approach it. So how would you describe your working relationship, taking in mind that you have both said yourself, or yourself, Mary Patterson, that you've come from it in a different way? Is there difficulties there with you working together in that respect? I mean, I'm thinking, or oh, even, uh, you know, correspondence, such as job centre closures, which we didn't know anything about until we saw it in the newspaper. So just wondering, is there difficulties there with you working together? I wouldn't have said so. I mean, clearly, uh, our ministers will sometimes have different views on how, uh, you know, how they might approach things. And that is partly why we have the joint uh, ministerial group, so that those issues can be discussed where, where, we, where we, always where we, uh, these issues might come up, we work on them together, as we have been doing on the, uh, most recently. Um, and uh, the ministers from both sides are committed to, to, to devolution and making this work successfully. So I think in the main, it, doesn't, it, it really doesn't create problems. We just, we, you know, we, we have to, as civil servants, we provide the sort of neutral advice ab about the options that might be available, and that's what we've been doing. Stephen Kerr, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think much the same. I mean, you know, we, we, we don't exist in a, a vacuum, of course. We work within the political um, circumstances of, of the day and, and our jobs to not let that constrain us, convener. Um, it's really to keep focusing on solutions to issues which, which arise. I mean, from a personal point of view, I've been working 13 years with UK government departments, so uh, on my list of um, shame or glory, uh, DFES, DFE... Uh, Biz, Dius, the Foreign Commonwealth Office, DWP, to name but a few. So, you know, I've never found in the way that I've gone about the business in the Scottish Government that these things have prevented us from, from working together. And if you look at the work that we were doing in the lead up to the independence referendum, we were introducing new devolved powers in partnership with DWP, the Scottish Welfare Fund, at the time when our ministers were obviously um, pursuing policies in an independent Scotland. So we find ways to make these things work. OK, I'll open that up to questions. Pete Lishit, do you want to come in? Well, thank you, and, and very grateful for coming along um, this, after, this morning. This is a bit unusual surroundings for us from the Scottish Affairs Committee, but we're grateful for this opportunity to ask you just a few questions about the process. My first question is about a process issue, and it's the fact that uh, Stephen, you're creating a, a new department out of absolutely nothing, no history, no background or culture about delivering uh, welfare benefits in Scotland, where the DWP has been in existence for 100 years, perhaps the largest Whitehall department, over 80,000 staff. How, how is this working then? And do you feel, first of all, Mr Kerr, that you're getting the adequate resource from the DWP in order to build and create this new department? And is there anything that you feel that you further require and need in order to ensure the early government um, intentions are going to be realised? I think if I can point to my left in terms of a visible manifestation of, of resource from DWP, I mean, Lisa has, can maybe say something in a moment about her experience, but so far we have found requests that we have made have been forthcoming in terms of resources. There have been lots of workshops, lots of meeting, lots of sharing of information. In fairness to colleagues in the UK government, that point you make, Chair, about um, capability building is quite important. You know, we have got to be in a certain place of readiness before we can engage meaningfully with DWP, who, as you say, are a department with a 100-year history. So there's an obligation on me to make sure I've got enough players on the field to be able to engage with DWP. And that can sometimes 
proved to be challenging, but where DWP can help us, they're doing so. Where other areas in the government can help us, you know, I find that they're doing so as well. Yeah, and Stephen um, alluded to it before in terms of bringing more people in to support us. We've recruited people in from all the other government departments, which is great, uh, but we're actually reaching out now um, across local government and other areas uh, with the external advertisements to bring even more capability in. The last session concentrated, and there was quite a few exchanges about some of the tensions in the relationship, and I was very impressed with your very political answer about how you serve different political masters and how these things are all evened out and everything works seamlessly. But can I suggest a couple of areas where there might just be a bit of concerns, and I'd be interested in your views as civil servants expected to deliver programmes for your respective governments. And, and there seems to be tensions right now about the changes in P PIP, for example, which we've seen at Westminster, the job centre closure pro programme, which we did a one-off session to try and better understand and see what the process was all about, and particularly the issue around housing benefit for 18 to 21-year-olds, where the Scottish Government have very clearly said that they want to make sure this is retained, where the UK Government are determined to progress with this. Maybe you could help us with this, this Ms Patterson. Where are we with this? Is, is the UK Government going to plough on with their plans regardless of what the Scottish Government want to do as an early priority in securing welfare powers? If, if, I, if I start on that one, Stephen, no doubt will want to come in. Uh, I think on the 18 to 21s, it's something we've been talking about for, for a while. Both governments have very clear policy positions on that. Um, we've been trying to work through it together to find the best way through to enable the UK government to deliver what it wants to deliver, uh, and likewise the Scottish government. But I think it's an area where we're in a bit of a, a period of transition uh, because the Scottish Government hasn't yet had time to, to put in all the frameworks, the, uh, the agency and so on, the legislation it needs to, to build its own system. Um, we have to find a way through with the legislation as, as it exists, either in Scotland or in the UK Parliament. Um, there will be issues like this where there isn't a perfect way through, but we do keep talking together to try and find the best way through that, f that fits the needs of both governments. It's mainly issues for the the joint ministerial committee then to deal with is that this worked out at a political level and then you're expected to try and come up with an arrangement that tries to meet both the requirements of your respective governments. Typically what would happen would be um, we know what our governments want to achieve and we would try and work through, be asked to work through at official level how we might, what the different ways for achieving that might be, either through changes in UK legislation or changes in Scottish government legislation or, or approach. And then we take options, ideally agreed solutions, recommended solutions up to the ministers, and then it's for them to, to ultimately decide, decide. Stephen, do you want to? I, th I think Pete's covered the territory well. I mean, we are, you know, we, as he says, the UK government has a policy position, the Scottish government has a policy position, and our job's to try and arrive at a place where both policies can be implemented, and discussions on that have been have been intense over um, a good few weeks, and um, we're still working and actively discussing that. I'm not, I'm not wanting to willfully suggest this, but is there any sort of sense that because the Scottish Government's department's all new, novel, not really got the experience in history, that it would tend just to go along with what the UK Government wants to do in terms of policy ambitions? When we see the job centre closure announcement, for example, the changes in PIP, some of the tensions around bedroom tax and benefit cap, is, do you feel that your, your early priorities are being addressed and being met? And can we hear from the, the, the UK civil servants that you will take into account the, the, the early priorities of the Scottish Government and you will do all you can to support them and ensure that they will be delivered? Yes, and I, I mean, you know, I would inevitably we, we look at the sort of areas of tension, but clearly there are things where we've made early successes. I mean, maybe not so much for this committee, but the employability changes happening in, in April, that's been very close joint work between both governments to support the um, implementation of the work programmes there. Um, the feasibility on the carers allowance increase, which clearly is not um, a UK government policy, us looking about options about how that might be delivered early, uh, also a good example of, of that. The only comment I would, I would make is, you know, I think it's fair to say I don't think I uh, work for a group of ministers who would allow us just to um, take the views of the UK government ministers and accept them. I think they're always pushing us, quite rightly, 
to look at the, the outcomes that they're looking to achieve in securing those. Uh, Stephen Hepburn, did you want to come in the supplementary on that one? Yes, Just, um, I wondered, bear in mind the two systems that are evolving, either side of the border, whether there was any border issues, and if there was, could you give any examples and how you're overcoming them? Uh, I, mean, I don't think we've come up with too many so far, but I would expect there to be some border issues. Um, you know, for example, um, where carers might be a good example, where someone, one side of the border is caring for someone, the other side of the border, and how that will work through in detailed policy uh, as we go forwards. Um, now, I don't think we've really come up with any concrete issues, problems around that so far, but we're probably at a fairly early stage in, in policy development in Scotland, but that's certainly the sort of thing we'd need to look very closely at. Have you got any special working party looking specifically into this uh, issue, possible problems with borders? I mean, no particular uh, working party on that. I think what we'll probably do is take each uh, policy as it comes, work through that and think about border issues as part of that. Now, it may be over time, we come to the stage where it looks to be a bigger cross-cutting issue that we need to look at separately across a number of areas, but at the moment, I think we take it on a policy-by-policy -policy basis. Just because there isn't you know, a, a forum or a group looking at it, it doesn't mean to say that people from my team and people from DWP aren't looking at this, so they are. They, they are talking about cross-cutting issues like residency. And for example, in our bill, we will have to be able to mark out the territory of who's a Scottish benefit claimant for the first time. So, of course, we can do that through the legislation. And as we start to implement the legislation through practice, then there'll be a requirement to keep that under review, of course, as well. Chris Law, did you want to come in on a sup on that? And then it's Mark Griffin. Yes, I just want to ask, um, given some of the challenges you face at the moment in terms of timing uh, with some of your policies, is there an openness and preparation from your ministers to delay implementation if there's not a common agreement found between two governments? Well, from a UK government position, I mean, UK government's got uh, it, its clear policy positions, the things it wants to implement across the UK at certain points in time. It's open to having conversations with the Scottish government about what the Scottish government wants to achieve and how best we can do that. Uh, I think it's fair to say that generally the UK government would be reluctant to delay its plans uh, um, uh, in the light of difficulties between the two, two governments and implementation uh, because it wants to deliver what it's, what it's committed to publicly. But, crucially, it would want to talk very uh, extensively to the Scottish Government to try and find that common way through that can meet the needs of both governments. I, mean, I think if you're, you're talking about implementation, I don't think there's a minister in either government who would just crack on regardless of you know an issue that arose. I mean, there are things that I've got to do in Scotland and the Scottish Government to be able to allow our system to be ready, and there are things that DWP has to do to be able to ensure that its system's ready as well, and nobody's going to proceed um, with decisions on either side until we're both happy that we're good to go. You know, the safe and secure, of transi the safe and secure transition is, is not a term that was just made up overnight. Um, it's something that really sits deeply at the heart of the programme. This is about people after all. And it would be um, a, a very uh, difficult and bad position for both governments to be in to press on regardless if we weren't satisfied that in the implementation side of things we were good to go. Okay. Um, Mark Griffin, do you want to go? Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, people have touched on the issue around um, the government's intention to abolish the bedroom tax and the apparent conflict there is with the benefit cap. Um, the previous panel's um, position, I think, it seems many people's position is that um, the agreement through the fiscal framework and the policy of no detriment would mean that um, if the government were to abolish the bedroom tax or to make any change to make a more generous provision, in a particular benefit, create a new benefit or top up, um, that that money would not be clawed back. Um, can I ask um, officials on both sides of the table if that is uh, both governments agreed positions? So, so on that one, I mean, both governments are clear about the outcome um, and that there would be no detriment. Our 
we're, uh, what we're trying to work through is a technical way about how we do that at the moment, so there is no difference. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. So, I can clarify, there is no political difference. Um, oh, po political will is, uh, is that there should be no detriment that the Scottish Government could, should be able to carry out that ambition without any uh, penalty on um, any recipient in Scotland. And it's purely a technical Purely just, a technical issue. It's a technical issue uh, in the in the sort of short to medium term. I think in particular, what we're very focused on is the outcome that the Scottish Government wants to achieve here in terms of uh, people it chooses to uh, uh, remove the removal of the, the spare room subsidy um, through UC, that those people should be able to benefit from that effect. Now, in practical terms, uh, in the short term, it's difficult to do that through the UC system but we're talking about alternative ways in which that could be achieved through discretionary housing payments. So, in effect, the Scottish Government will pay no more than it pays uh, in total uh, for, the, uh, for the removal of the spare room subsidy change, uh, but it does it through discretionary housing payments rather than through the, the UC system. But that's a, that's a technical, practical way in which we, we might need to address it or option for addressing it in the short term, looking at longer-term solutions uh, uh, later. You can't really divorce the, the, the two things, and I think my, my colleagues in DWP would agree. The government's manifesto commitment <clears throat> is to abolish the bedroom tax at source. Those words, at source, are really important. At source means within the UK government's universal credit system, which is still being built and developed and being rolled out across the UK. So getting in and about that system is what is required to deliver that manifesto commitment. So when you hear language around technical aspects to implementing this, that's what the discussion um, is referring to. And I would underline the point about the outcome. Our ministers have been very clear on what the outcome is, that this UK government's policy should be reversed with no impact on the benefit cap, or the benefit cap not having an impact on that policy. That's been heard loud and clear. That's what the focus is on. And uh, like housing benefit, that's where the discussions are at at the moment to try how one gives effect to that policy. Uh, to my kids, yep, just briefly, do the Scottish Government have a continued commitment to uh, mitigate until um, removed that source, as you said? Ministers do have that commitment, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Ruth McGuire, did you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the experience panels. Um, I think it is inherently sensible to um, use the expertise of people with the lived experience of, of benefits. But I just wonder how um, you view the potential dilemma if um, you're going down one road in terms of delivery and the views of the experience panels um, surely would like something different. I, th I think you're right to say it's, it's the correct approach for you know, um, an undertaking of this nature. Um, if we end up completely diverging, then we've done something wrong, quite obviously. Um, and the panels are there to help us develop the system uh, and the policy and the practice. Might there ever be occasions when what the panels want we can't deliver? Yes. Would we explain why? Yes. Would we then focus on compromises, different ways of achieving the same outcome? What's the best way to overcome the issue that's been identified? Absolutely. And although the experience panels will provide quite a rich source of evidence, they won't be the only place that we go to. So you've got the new disability, I can never remember the name of this thing, Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group. There you go chaired by uh, Dr Jim McCormick, who is familiar to many people around the table. So another place where the voice of individuals claiming benefits can be captured. Um, we're quite excited about it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen Scottish Government analysts. You have actually. Uh, <laughs> Dr Signorini comes here and uh, sits in front of this committee. He's very disappointed you never ask him questions. But his team are wildly excited by all of this. They think this is a, a, a magnificent approach to policy that the Scottish Government's taking on. So. Um, we look at it um, absolutely as something that is going to provide us with a, a huge seam of evidence over the next few years. Yeah, just briefly, convener, I, th I think that um, that is the right approach to take, and I think as long as everyone's clear about why decisions are being taken, then it avoids any any mishaps with different direction. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. Um, we've heard relatively little, I feel certainly, from both governments on the issue of topping up reserved benefits. So can I ask if the systems, do the systems for reserved benefits to be topped up currently exist? Do the DWP systems allow, to, so we're looking at one area in particular, we're looking at carers allowance and you've heard a bit about the feasibility work that's gone on. Uh, we're looking at that now. We're trying to um, uh, understand what the options are around DWP doing it on our behalf, or whether there's uh, other routes as well. We, we've got we, we, we've used the term governance and programmes, um, and that's really important for members of, of both committees to understand. There's yes, um, a lot of informal contact, but there's formality in terms of how the government works. So I've got to look at that study and look at whether, for example, things like the value for money case stacks up. We've got project boards in place that need to look at the carers alliance work. Then it will come to a programme board, which I'm on as well. So there's a process that we are currently taking that work through to understand whether the DWP systems um, can top up uh, carers alliance and what the cost of that would be and how quickly that could be done as well. I don't know if there's, no. yeah, she wants. So yeah. that's, so, so, I mean, I think, in, in each case, I mean, the carer's allowance is obviously the one that's sort of come first in terms of a, a variation to a uh, UK uh, government poly um, benefit in advance, actually, of it being fully devolved or in the transition period. Um, and I think what my, my, my feeling is that when, if future uh, ideas come forward for topping up uh, reserve benefits, then that will be a discussion to have between the two governments about feasibility um, and deliverability of that. So I think it will, I mean, I think that's the only, and it's, it's, it's sort of, it's in the hybrid area, I suppose, in terms of top up, because it is, it is going to be, it is a devolved benefit. And I, I guess when these systems were developed by the UK government, um, the scenario we're in now was never envisaged. So you are having to have a look at the capability of mm -hmm infrastructure that in many cases is several decades old and whether it can cope with that? Um, certainly in my own party's views, we'd like to see child benefit, for example, um, increased by five pounds. Is there any discussion at all into what might happen if a Scottish government in future proposed such a change? Would no, not, no, not, as far no, as not at the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm focused on what the current Scottish government's doing. And, and child benefits administered by HMRC. So. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Adam Tompkins. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, in the previous panel, we heard quite a lot um, about the importance of transparency. Uh, and of course, it's in all of our interests as parliamentarians, which, irrespective of which parliament we serve in, irrespective of whether we're government or opposition politicians, um, to have as much transparency in intergovernmental communications and intergovernmental operations as possible. It seems that the, you know, the key um, uh, piece of the interinstitutional um, uh, architecture uh, is the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which you have all been operating now for some months. How can it be made more transparent so that we can do our jobs more effectively? I know that you have a particular answer to that, Professor Tompkins, which is uh, a request <laughs> to be in the room. The discussions have taken place, and I know you've have, uh, raised that with my ministers. <laughs> What's that? You're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, these are issues I, I, I think you know you, you should explore with with our ministers. I mean, you recognise there's a balance to be struck, isn't there, between the space for discussions to take place between ministers and and making sure there is um, a, a degree of um, visibility about what those discussions and, and when those discussions take place. Ministers are, as you all know, accountable to both parliaments, so you can ask them questions at any time in this committee. Um, if I can slightly move the question on deliberately so um, to an area that I, I, I can say something more about, and there was a point in the previous session about um, whether officials could do more with stakeholders and, and forums between officials and stakeholders, and I think we were all struck by that suggestion, so that's something I'm, I'm very happy to look at, but in terms of transparency of the ministerial group, I think we would ask you to probably explore that further with our ministers next week. Anything else you want to say? No. 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 Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Ian Murray, did you want to come in the supplementary? I saw your hand up. Yeah, yes, please. Okay, um, and then Margaret Ferrier. I think I agree with Mr Tompkins to a certain extent, um, not necessarily with this joint working group on welfare, but we've seen communiques coming out of the uh, ministerial committees for the fiscal framework. And I remember one in particular that said that the ministers, the finance secretary and the chief secretary of the treasury met. This was the sixth time they'd met. They look forward to meeting again soon. And that was the uh, minute from a particular uh, meeting. So you can see why there is a little bit of frustration that we are finding it difficult to be able to hold governments to account when we don't really know what's happening in terms of these kinds of discussions. Um, but my question goes to... Um, the way in which your um, respective organisations are working together. And, and there's no doubt you're doing a tremendous job in terms of trying to pull together some of these incredibly complex issues that ultimately affect people's lives of the most vulnerable, which is incredibly important to get right. But there was a communique um, from October last year that split off both the executive competence of the uh, two of the remaining um, competencies, which are the biggest one, disability uh, allowances and carers being one of them, and the legislative competence. Can you just explain a little bit about why you came to that decision and, and what is the need for splitting off those two competencies to push it out to 2020? I'll start. I'll start. Um, and the purpose is there to ensure that, A, the system can carry on so people keep getting the very important benefits they, they need to get, while the Scottish Government is developing its plans and particularly its legislation uh, for the new system that it wants to bring in. So uh, it says in the short term we can transfer or give the Scottish Government legislative competence, it can take forward its, its bill uh, a bit later in, in the year. Um, and then at the point at which that starts to be commenced, then that will be the point at which we transfer executive competence. But in the, in the meantime, the UK government can retain that competence so it can carry on delivering benefits, people can carry on getting the very important payments. Uh, the crucial thing is to make sure that only one government has executive competence at one time. So there is a sort of immediate point of transfer when the UK government will pass it across to the Scottish government it may be then at some point, at that point, on some benefits, some issues, the Scottish Government might still want UK Government support in delivery, but we'd be delivering very much for the Scottish Government under agency agreements rather than, uh, rather than for ourselves. Stephen, is that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, you could put it another way, which is if we didn't do it, what happens when we pass our legislation? We become responsible for delivering the benefits and with the best will in the world, we're not going to have the infrastructure in place in time to do that, so that's the need to separate them out. Why, why is it different for those two and not the other 10 or 11 competencies out of the package of 13? Are they just easier to administer because it's a single transfer? I think, I think these are the ones that are left over, essentially the, the, the benefits that we currently deliver. So, for example, the employability support is, is, is different. That's you know, transferring across pretty well immediately, or discretionary housing payments, again, is transferring this April, but it's the, you know, it's the 11 or so benefits um, that need to carry on being delivered through this period of transition. That's why we've taken this, this particular approach. And I think it is, you know, I think it's a really good example of the two governments and two sets of officials working very closely together to find a solution that works crucially first for the, for the customer, uh, provides that seamless transition, but also for, for both, both governments. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Ferry. Thank you, Convener. Just, just a quick question. I think Stephen mentioned briefly at the beginning um, of the involvement of the Scotland office in all of this. Um, could, could you maybe expand on that and tell us what their role has been in ensuring the smooth transition of powers between both governments? Could they be doing more? Are they doing enough? The Scotland Office, I, I think, you know, aren't, aren't here today and, and we might think um, if we've had uh, lots of fun today uh, reconvening all of this with them too. Um, I think they do provide a useful place for both governments. So from my point of view, um, if I don't quite understand what might be happening behind the scenes at a UK level, I can pick up the phone to people in the Scotland Office, they can help. Um, Scotland Office ministers are keen always to broker compromises between the Scottish Government and other departments in the UK Government and David Mundell is very active in that regard as well. Um, they can sometimes um, just help unblock things at official level which happen from time to time. So 
if, if they weren't there, would we miss them? Would we think there was a need for something like that in the system to make the devolution of these powers in particular work? I think we probably would, actually. Yes, and I think I mean, they bring that expertise of having worked in this sort of area for a long time and ensure that you know, we can go to them for advice about, uh, about sort of issues to do with, with Scotland. They, uh, as Stephen says, can, can help us. Uh, not least, they, they have that picture of the, the whole landscape of devolution and what's happening um, and potentially can sort of show, show us good practice of what's been happening in other departments that we can learn from. So they kind of hold, they can hold the ring on that as well. <coughs> Deirdre Brock. <clears throat> um, I, I wonder, can I ask um, Mr Searle and Ms Patterson how you respond to the suggestion made by the previous panel that the sheer size of the DWP is a problem um, in that while a few senior civil servants such as yourselves have a great knowledge of Scotland and the devolutionary issues, um, there are many others in different sections of the D DWP who don't um, and, and who aren't thinking about the impact of changes they might be introducing on Scotland at all. Uh, what specifically can you do to improve that situation? So, um, we've got a, a, a devolution capability building plan um, and it's made up of uh, a number of elements, one of which, for example, is that we have devolution champions and uh, we, that we have a network of these that meet uh, and, and advise uh, from about every month. So they're working with colleagues who are working on policy or operations or administration to think about the implications of devolution. There is, it's, it's fair to say there is, there's, we need to continue to build knowledge and understanding. Um, we do, we're doing some joint communications uh, and we've got a joint communication framework so that um, uh, colleagues in both both organisations are hearing things expressed in the same way. Um, and I think, you know, the work we were doing on employability for uh, 2017 saw a lot of close working between um, uh, Scottish Government and our colleagues in Job Centre Plus to work through and understand the implications of the changes, what it would mean in practice. So it works on different levels, really. So colleagues that are working on policy need to think about devolution <coughs> in terms of policy. And our staff working on the ground in our frontline offices need to understand the implications of, um, of support coming directly from Scotland or how they interact. And I think as we work through the implementation, alongside that has to be a very robust communications, learning and development plan. Um, we've talked already a bit about communicating with the public and it's just as important we are communicating with our staff um, about the changes and the different landscape we work on. So it's still a work in practice. As you say, it's a very big organisation, but I think there's a mixture of, and we have an internet site with, on devolution where we have updates on it. So it's about that general understanding, the policy colleagues who are working specifically on policies that might have an impact, getting a deeper understanding, and then when we implement changes, the staff on the ground who are, who are working with those changes understand how to work in practice, so different levels. Okay. It, yeah, if you would mind. So, so, therefore, I mean, that sounds like there's a, a, some work going on there, which is good. Um, can you give a, an assurance, then, that something such as the job centre closures, where a Scottish Government minister wasn't informed of this, despite it being you know, his, his responsibility, would never happen again? Do you think that there are sufficient structures in place to prevent that ever happening? specific uh, issues around the Job Centre Plus closures to do with the commercial arrangements. I, I mean, I wasn't um, involved in that directly, so I think there were some very specific issues around that. But generally, um, going forward for future, uh, in future changes um, and where we're working on things that might have an implication for, uh, Scottish, for Scotland, then the idea of uh, us building our knowledge within the department is what, what that's what intends to do. Thank you. Did you want to come back in on that, or okay. George Adams? Thank you, convener. Good morning. I would just like to ask. It's it's good to hear that you're all working together and uh, things seems to be going quite well that way. It's nice to know that civil servants can have a wee team huddle and get things sorted out. But the whole point is the fact that. Uh, you do have, as Steve mentioned earlier on, two entirely different political masters. Uh, does that lead to tensions uh, with yourselves for delivery? Uh, does it, in Stephen's case, does it give you tensions to possibly deliver earlier 
than what you'd expect to do as well. And you know, how, how does that can add to the tension of you as civil servants trying to deliver both governments, which are in some cases diametric, can't even agree in the word. One says welfare, the other one says social security. So, you know, how how do you manage to kind of make sure you deliver and balance that out? A couple of th thoughts on, well, where, where those issues, and we've focused on them quite a lot today, where the issues arise, we try and work uh, across the piece to think about solutions to them wherever we can and offer those up. Um, in terms of implementation, uh, I think ministers from both departments are really clear and both organisations are really clear that they want to see safe implementation of this. So, uh, I mean, I'm very experienced in doing programme and change and I would expect to talk to ministers about, uh, with, with Stephen, uh, about delivery dates and how safe they are and how we can make that happen, uh, what the issues and risks around anything are. Um, but I know that the ministers share that view, that they want this to be safely implemented. The agreement's been made about the devolution of powers and the governments now want to make it safely, for safely implemented. So I think that's where the, there's certainly agreement. And we work, we work through that. I mean, you know, check, delivery of, uh, of complex change like this is, is, a, is very significant. Um, we've got, um, it's a complex system with lots of um, uh, a variation of, of, of welfare payments and benefits in it, which actually interact with one another um, and then also interact uh, with DWP. So we need to work through that and develop, particularly on the DWP side, we need to understand as Scottish Government work through its its plans and its design, how best we intercept that to provide uh, what Sc Scottish Government need for, for Scottish uh, customers um, um, in our terms of our IT systems, in terms of our new business processes, in terms of customer-facing products, but also what we need to design into our system, new processes and new IT functionality potentially, that ensures that we get flow of information both ways where, that, where that's needed. So, it, you know, it is a complicated delivery um, and we will work through that uh, together and we will be talking to our ministers jointly. And one of the things that the joint ministerial working group will no doubt move on to um, will be the milestones for delivery and how we're doing against them and so forth. I mean, just, just in terms of <clears throat> uh, the word pressure you mentioned, you know, um, and, and I think Mary's dealt with the point about political pressure, you know, we understand the political environment we work within, but our job is to, is to um, within that, achieve ministers' objectives. Um, <clears throat> do we feel pressure in terms of what we're doing? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we tell everybody that comes to work in this area, these are going to be difficult jobs and hard times, but do I think we can do this uh, working together? Absolutely, no doubt about that at all. Um, we've worked really hard. I've worked personally very hard to develop an open, honest relationship with both the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister. I enjoy working with them. They listen to our advice, they respect our advice. We operate on the basis of no surprises. So I think we've got the key ingredients that we need in terms of working with ministers for the future to be able to make sure this endeavour is successful as well. We're speaking to ministers next week, obviously we're very much looking forward to that session. Would you, would you have the confidence of senior civil servants to turn around to senior ministers and say, hold on a minute, this looks like it's cutting across uh, devolved competencies and there might be an issue that we want to alert you to. Is that something that's within your, your, your um, brief or your competence to turn around and say quite clearly to ministers that hey, there's a an issue here, and I'm thinking once again to the 18 to 21 year olds housing benefit issue again, which does seem to be unresolved, possibly to the detriment of Scottish 18 to 21 year olds. What, what do you say to, to ministers when something like this comes across? Absolutely, be be open to to sharing with them, you know, all the information and advice. So if if it looked as though it could cut across uh, developed competence, or we felt the Scottish government felt that it could then we would make that clear to our ministers and, again, put the options uh, before them. Uh, I think in that particular case, um, you know, as we talked about earlier on, it is you know, two governments with two different uh, objectives and policies, and it's about working together, which we continue to work together on that to find the best way through. So our respective ministers are going to talk about that further next week. Um, we're still exploring. It's a challenge. The time is very tight, but we are working together. Thank you. I've got two supplementaries. I know that time is running short because obviously our colleagues have to head down to Westminster for the Brexit vote. Chris Law. 
Convener, interesting you just mentioned Brexit. Um, what happens, whilst we're on the topic, what happens if due to Brexit or other pressures or even plain political will, it's made clear that working with Scotland on the transition is not just the key priority for DWP? How will that impact on staff working, for example, at DWP level, the transition process, and on your joint working relationship, which you said is key? And also I'd like to hear from, the, the Scot uh, from Stephen and Lisa in response to that as well. Thank you. Difficult to talk in the abstract. That's that's certainly not the position now. Certainly, it is one of you know the top priorities to make this work. I would expect that to carry on being the case. Um, inevitably, you know, pressures will arise from all sorts of different directions. Brexit being one, and then departments will need to think about how they uh, allocate resource. But I can't envisage a situation in which uh, you know getting the right resource in place to support this agenda. Uh, wouldn't make, remain a priority for my department and my government. I, I think we would, um, well, it's, that's good to hear, but I didn't need to come here today to know that to be the case um, at official level. And um, if in the scenario that you're painting out that that, you know, were to happen, um, unnatural and unlikely as we think it to be, then we would look at what was possible at our own hand in terms of moving forward a lot of the work. So we know there's going to be an agency. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to establish an agency and that's work that could continue um, quite easily at our own hands. But you know, this is a joint programme of work for a reason. We're, we're embarked on this together. I think the most important thing for me that you know we haven't quite touched on, but everything that we do in terms of joining up as the two governments is putting the customer at the heart of everything. So everything that we do, all the joint working, all the good um, workshops, the relationships that we have with uh, the UK government is around what, what are we doing for the customer? So actually, you know, we, we shouldn't come to a point or we won't come to a point where we have to stop because we have to progress this actually to support the, the people. Thank you. Margaret Ferry, you want a small supplementary? Quite, quite small convener, okay. yes. Um, <laughs> just a question really to, to Mary. Uh, I notice uh, you're the Director of Ageing Society and State Pensions, so just tying it back, there has been some criticism regarding the communication between the DWP and Scottish Government, but also there, there's, there's this question that myself and my colleagues asked the minister about whether they would actually approach all of the claimants and let them know that the job centres in their area were closing and they refused to do that. There, there seems to be a bit of a pattern forming um, because if we look again at the women against state pension inequality issue, again, a lot of these women didn't know that that was coming down the road to them. So how can communication be improved between the DWP and its clients going forward? Um, uh, so I think we can always be always be looking at different ways of communicating uh, with customers as we um, as we're developing the universal credit service. We're doing more and more through that online route to talk to people. Um, the check your state pension uh, service that is now online. Gives, uh, is, is very accessible, allows people to find out what their state pension is going to be. We continue to work through all sorts of different ways of communicating using new technology as well as traditional technology. Um, sometimes letters are the right answer, sometimes people do, don't respond to them or don't see them, sometimes we can't always get people's right addresses, it, all sorts of reasons. But so we want to look at a range of ways of communicating with people about, uh, about DWP services. And I think going forward in terms of working together, uh, we're certainly, even at the moment, working on a joint communications plan so that we're working on those joint milestones to make sure that you know, we are talking to each other and we, we're informing the people uh, that you to receive these benefits. They touched on it earlier around how, how important communication is going to be. It's absolutely going to be critical. You know, a seamless service, people to be able to come to Scottish Government or DWP or... Uh, other uh, departments across uh, across the UK. So it's absolutely critical that we absolutely get that right. It absolutely is. Um, uh, maybe we should have a communications minister because we don't seem to have got it right so far. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we've learned quite a lot. I didn't know you had devolution champions. Uh, I wonder if you have, is it a group specific or is it taken from various groups? Can we get uh, yes, so a we... list of the names being the... Yeah, so they're in of transparency. The, yeah, so, well, they're, they're officials within the department and they mm. come from 
So, so from Pete, well, obviously Pete, because he has policy for devolution in his area, but for example, in my directorate, where I have not only pensions, but I also have carer's allowance, attendance allowance, and winter fuel payments responsibility, um, I, I will have a champion. So they work across that kind of, that, that network, and then they meet to ensure that they're building their understanding. And also they set up, so I think last week it was, we had a devolution awareness week where we had lots of sessions for staff to come and find out about devolution. So that's... Yeah. So when we're talking about the devolution champions and you've set up a group, or not you personally, but obviously, do they have any say in you know, the memorandum understanding or the other groups? I mean, where does the, who do they feed their information into? They're primarily feeding information into Pete's devolution team mm. at the moment. Um, uh, but as we work, start working through potentially through the implementation of devolution, you could see them interacting as well with the, the, the programme team. So uh, I think you could see their, their, um, their role evolve over time. But it, their, their role primarily, coming back to the point earlier, is, is to make sure that it's not just people like me and Mary and our teams who who understand and, and work in the space, but actually right across the department, people understand what it is the Scottish Government want to achieve, what we need to do to support that, um, and don't do things that, that cut across that. Now, I won't say we'd always get it right every time, but we, we certainly try to. Maybe I could be a wee bit cheeky then, and maybe ask Stephen. Um, Devolution champions feeding in, there's obviously minutes there, talking about communication, transparency. Would we, as... <clears throat> excuse me, a committee be able to see uh, these papers or minutes or whatever they are? It's, it, it's, it's a DWP Would initiative to, to the to Devolution Champion. Get network. access to that. I mean, it's not a, a formal, <clears throat> it's not a formal sort of piece of governance in that way. It's, it's more of a network within DWP of officials um, to make sure that that awareness is there. So it, it's not something where we'd have formal minutes ourselves. Or any, any minutes at all, then? Uh, I'm, no. I'm, I'm not aware that there would be. I mean, there might be some sort of some sort of high-level internal record of what of what was discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really is just a just a mechanism, at official level, to try and raise awareness throughout throughout the organisation. It's no, nothing more. I, I don't want to labour at this point, but the point I'm trying to make is when you talk about transparency, corresponding with people. Yeah, the job centres have been brought up a number of occasions. We had visited Musselburgh Job Centre spoke to people there, no one told us at all from the DWP that they were actually in the process of closing them down. Uh, so you wonder if the information that you're collating from the devolution team, if that takes that in and it's fed back in, why can't elected official politicians be party to that knowledge? The, the, I would really like to know what they are feeding in. Uh, well, it's, it's partly what they're feeding in, but it's also what they're feeding out to, to their team. So you'll have, you know, you might have someone on who's working on labour market issues and their role is to make sure that their wider team, their colleagues in that part of DWP, understand they're thinking about the devolution consequences of, uh, of their policies. I mean, I think coming back to estates, uh, you know, I know it's a, it's a sensitive issue, but those were commercial decisions, very sensitive commercial negotiations, um, and it simply wasn't possible to... Um, to make that more widely known before those commercial considerations, uh, negotiations had, had finished. It wouldn't be in the interest of the taxpayer to do so. Uh, and I know that people aren't happy with that, but that, that's, that's the reason. Yeah, well, well, certainly they did communicate with the landlords and in areas of Glasgow, Castlemilk, for instance, they approached the DWP and said that they would reduce what they were paying but nobody listened to them. And I mean, I'm not blaming yourself. Or maybe it's an issue we can raise next week at the other committee. Um, but uh, thank you very, very much for, for coming along. It's been a pleasure you know, speaking to you and getting your information back. And the uh, session's just about concluded. But before we do leave, uh, can I actually thank also the members of the Scottish Affairs Committee for participating today and remind everyone that our next meeting is next Monday, 20th March at Westminster's uh, under your auspice, <laughs> Pete. Thank you very much. I'll close the meeting now. Thank you. <laughs>